Music.com. Oh, there it goes again. Um, and welcome to the eighth episode of the Music Space. Today, my special guest is Mr. Rob Pippin. How you going, Rob? Hey, Gary. Good to yeah. see you again. You too. Um, Rob's an Adelaide guitarist and a musical director, and a whole bunch of other hats that he wears as well. Uh, we're, we're here to inspire and interact, um, so don't forget your Q&A apps. Uh, get your headphones on. And let's go. So, Rob, you've had about 44 years in the industry, yeah, I believe. Yeah, a long time ago when I was very young. Yeah, I bet you must have been, what, three? <laughs> Eight years old, I think it was. Eight, Eight. or nine. And so we know how nine. old you are now. Yeah, exactly, so the mathematics. So how did you get into music in the first place? Just in the 60s, seeing lots of stuff on TV in black and white. Yeah. A lot of Australian artists who I thought were really good at the time, and people like Russell Morris was around when he was starting off, and, and Brian Cadd and Glenn Shark and, and then um, that inspired me. I got my first guitar on Christmas of 69, and just started teaching myself because I'm totally self-taught as a player. Yeah. And uh, and from there, just deciding to get into a band when I was 14, you know, and trying to do something with it and playing more and rehearsing and and then building there from from there, 10 years of being in small bands, at, you know, sort of semi-pro and then trying to jump into it full time. Yeah. And then um, and that was about 30 years ago. I went full time as a player, and we well, here I am today. Yeah. So who who would you say were your major influences and or, and and who are now? Yeah. Um. A lot of times when I was younger was probably Australian and English guitar players, you know. So from England, I love Gary, uh, Andy Scott from the Sweets, you know, the guys from Status Quo. Um, uh, in Australia, guys like John Dallimore, um, guys from the River Band, um, uh, lots of different guitar players. And then I discovered Gary Moore in the late 70s. He became my, my main influence, I suppose. Yeah. Well, him, him and Richie Blackmore, I suppose. Then a guitarist called Michael Schenker from Europe. Um, and Steve Morse, discovered him in the late 70s as well, and he was in Dixie Dregs. Um, and uh, then just he just kept sort of stacking up a lot of rock, rock players, metal players, Jimmy Page, a um, bit of Hendrix, um, Clapton. You know, I've, I've kind of studied most of the world's guitar players, I suppose, yeah. over a period of time to learn how they do it and copy their licks and solos and their sort of styles and um, a, a lot of players. But they were my main, my main players, I'd say. Yeah, okay. And during that time, uh, during your career, you've obviously worked with hundreds of people, if not thousands. Um, who would be some of your favourites or the standout ones? Um, what, one of my jobs is, uh, is that I'm a musical director for lots of artists coming to Adelaide and sometimes around Australia. So I've worked with people like Ross Wilson over the years, um, uh, Glenn Shorrock from Little River Band many times over the last 27 years, Jim Keyes from Master Apprentices who recently passed away, um, uh, worked closely with the guys from the Angels, um, various projects for the Angels, um, John Paul Young, it's, it's a lot of classic rock artists, Phil Emanuel, guitar player, he's a good friend of mine from Brisbane, um, and sort of my role is to be their guitar player and also musical director, so I put a group together and we, we play and do concerts with them, and my role is to play lead guitar and also make sure the band's playing all the right material and the arrangements are right. Yeah. So a bit of everything, and all of them tend to have a, an influence on what you do as a guitar player. Yeah. Mm. So what do you find are the, the greatest challenges in working with other people? I mean, what, what sort of things do you find more, well, challenging? I yeah. Guess is... um, <laughs> well, firstly, I mean, it starts with the music. I mean, you've got to, you know, play the songs. Um, and so musically, the challenge is that if you're playing with an artist, you've got to decide what, what the brief is. And usually the brief is to copy the record. So, you know, if, if there's a, a track that's got particular, you know, parts and arrangements, I think you should, you know, copy that that's what I get hired to do yeah um, 
which can be a challenge because you always have to gear shift. You've got to work out well, what the, what's, how does the song go and how does my part go in terms of the song. So um, you, you can't be a specialist just as one thing. You've got to, in my area, be a session musician where you've got to morph into their style and their arrangement. So that's a challenge. Um, it gets easier the more you do it. Yeah. You know? um, well, obviously, you need to be aware of what the other musicians are playing and whether they're yeah whether they're uh, playing the correct part and correct and then keeping everybody happy and yeah uh, and that's one of the biggest challenges I know it is it's good 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 PR skills with people you know um, I think that um, in my situation as a as a guitar player and more so, more so musical director I, I tend to not say a lot to my players because I figure they know what they're doing and they can find their part as long as I keep everyone organised and on track well, we should have a good end result yeah you know I think that. You know, you shouldn't be over someone's top of someone's back saying, "Oh, you missed that F sharp note in that part." Well, they probably know that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I think I think um, just uh, making the environment you're working in really easy, making yeah. it so there's no one's feeling stressed, there's no pressure from anyone, and everyone's just enjoying the process. And that's, you know, it's not necessarily a challenge, but that's what you should aim for, for doing. I think. Yeah. Well, having having worked with you plenty of times myself, mm. Rob, I think you you always seem to create a pretty relaxed, happy environment and the, the people that you choose tend to be the right sort of people for, for the gig. So that, mm. that's a talent as well, putting the right people together. Temperament. You know, I think if you're working with someone that's unreliable, even if they're talented, it doesn't make much difference. At the end of the day, it's probably going to fall off. Yeah. You know, um, you know so, and being organised too. You know, like everyone's got to have the same material and have it ready in time. So I think organisation is a big factor too. So. Um, be organised, folks. That's what it's all about. Well, yes, it is good for a lot of musicians <laughs> to have somebody in charge of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a good thing. So um, throughout a varied career, yep. you've done you know some touring, some recording, um, obviously being musical director for lots of different acts. What um, what's the sort of thing you prefer to do the most? What what sort of inspires you the most? Uh, it's, it's always a bit of a I, every each week, I'm, I'm, I spend about 20 hours a week doing individual guitar lessons, yeah. which I still really enjoy doing. But you know, I, I do concerts and shows every week, which I enjoy putting together. But I'm also in the studio, always recording um, original material. So my week's sort of split up into three hemispheres. It's not just one thing that happens. Um, I did a national TV commercial yesterday, which I really enjoyed doing. It's just nice being in the studio with no one around and just writing something, and you know, a singer comes and you do something. So I, I tend to like a, three different things simultaneously. Um, I've always liked teaching and training. I've done it for a long time, and I'm, I like performing for people. So there's no one answer to that. I think it's all three. It keeps me, I suppose, stimulated. Perhaps the diversity is the answer. Yeah, diversity is the answer. I couldn't just be just a guitar player or just yeah. a programmer. Or yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one. You know, yeah, you need to do lots of different projects to mm. to feel well rounded. Yeah, which just helps you to be a better musician. Exactly uh, across the board. You know, you think differently as well if you're playing with other musicians or writing songs because you've got to think. Not like a guitar player. Sometimes you have to think like a musician and think. Yeah, that's right. A good guitar player could be a good musician. I think that's the role of any instrumentalist to be a musician mm. before their uh, before their instrument. I yeah, is the most important thing because literally you should be able to pick up any instrument and make a vague sound on mm. it. I think as a yeah as a musician, um, perhaps more vague than other instruments sometimes. Yeah, depending on what we're uh, yeah what what we're good mm -hmm. at and what we're yeah. not. Yeah. Um, so the, the topic you've chosen today is uh, using backing tracks to develop mm. your lead guitar skills. Yes. Yeah. Um, you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Um, look, as I was developing as a, as a musician, I think uh, I started off being more of a copyist, and then I realised I didn't have all the improvisation skills that I really wanted to have. But I think when you're developing as improvisers, it's good to have reference points that you can, you know, you, you can channel, I suppose, and then make your own. Um, Playing with backing tracks, I think, is the fastest way a guitar player can improve their skills in a short period of time. You know, I think everyone wants to silver bullet, and I think one of the silver bullets is sitting down for half an hour to an hour a day playing against a piece of music. Yeah. And um, it, it forces you to do a, a wide variety of things. It forces you to find the right scales, to get your phrasing together, get your guitar sound together, um, get your vibrato, and learn the correct licks. So I figured that today that would be a, a useful topic yeah. for anyone watching this. It's it's a never-ending process too. It's not like you just do it for a year and that's it. You're done. That's right. It's something you can craft forever. Well, most of us want to get better than we are, than we are. Mm. Um, exactly. And, and so you know, practice is a is a vital thing. Mm. And there are so many great programs available too nowadays to for improvising yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know the iReal book, um, which is a 
a, a new version of the real book for anyone who knows okay. what I'm talking about. Fantastic, full of jazz standards, and you can play yep. along with the jazz trio. Mm -hmm. Great for young students. Yep. Um, there's also rock equivalents. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so there's definitely many, many um, uh, programs available out there for people looking for that. Mm -hmm. So what are you using yourself, Rob? Uh, I've got my laptop. I've got a Mac, uh, MacBook Pro here. I use Logic Audio. Um, I've been using it since the early 90s, and I'm um, very comfortable with it. Um, I can build my own backing tracks or... Um, from it, you programming it, and change key and tempo, um, and feels easily. So I use it to play back tracks, which I'm using today. Cool. Mm. So take us through some of the steps of of um, practicing with backing tracks. What, yeah. what do you think some of the important elements are? Okay. Well, the thing that's probably one thing I sort of talk to my students regularly at nauseum is finding the key of the piece. Uh, once you find the key of a piece of music, it'll tell you what to play. But until you've got that, it's like having a blindfold on musically. Um, the piece I've got here, for example, is in the key of C major. I'll just play a couple of bars just so everyone can hear it, all right? So look, basically it's like a C major thing. So once you establish, for example, on, the, on a backing track what key you know the, the music is playing you know, and the chords, that starts telling you what possible scales to use. So that's stage one. So this key is in C major, so straight away we can use a C major scale. Um, now, guitar players, of course, know it's a good old C major scale, but very few guitar players can make that one work because it's a very strange fingering. There are also a couple of notes there that you don't want to be playing too yeah. often, like the fourth and the seventh. Correct. Which are very nice against a blues sort of. Correct. As in the... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so, but there are seven seven scales in the key of C major, and I think um, um, for anyone watching this now, getting to learn what your modes are, are going to be an important factor. So, for example, uh, if you're in C major, the first mode is of course C major, and then there's seven modes linked to that. Would be D Dorian scales. Next one, then E Phrygian. Then F Lydian, then G mixed Lydian, then back to A minor. I might go down an octave for that. Then B Lockerian, then back to C major. So um, I think a, a turning point for me as a guitar player was um, seeing a workshop with Frank Gambale in the in the 80s, where he discussed modes and their usage and um, that's why I started, you know, from that day I remember going, okay, well, this is how guitar players start thinking. I, I was just playing randomly before that, not understanding the mechanics behind it. Um, so in terms of this key here, it's C major, and those modes apply. Um, however, when you're doing blues, a lot of times it sounds better to use a minor scale against it. Yeah. Um, what I might do is I'll just run the track just for a few bars and play C minor. So the track's in C major, but I'm going to use C minor against it. Now, technically, in theory, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's a pentatonic, basically, isn't it? Yeah, uh, but the theory is that really, initially, the track in C major, you should play C major, but in blues, you play minor against major. Um, and I, I call that superimposing one sound over another. It's also called modal mixing. So modal mixing is where you might um, use two different scales um, against each other. So what I might do to give you an example of what can sound really cool from a scale point of view is the thing works in C major. Okay. Um, then C minor. And if I combine the two, I'll just do this. Try again, Gary. So you see a bit of both. So I'm using a bit of the major scale and the minor scale, and that's called modal mixing. And so um, in terms of scales, so then if you're thinking C minor, you wouldn't use a natural minor scale because blues doesn't use that. You might use the good old pentatonic scale, which everyone on planet Earth would know. That's leaving out the fourth and the seventh of the major scale. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a very simple box-shaped scale. 
you know, you can you can make a lot out of that. Um, I think that takes it does take skill and practice with backing tracks to make it sound good, and that's sometimes guitar players go, oh, that scale's a bit boring. Well, I think it's better to blame yourself rather than the scale. Mm. You know, it's up to you to make the notes sound good. Don't blame the scale. Yeah, right. You know, uh, I agree with that. So, uh, so finding the key of the solo helps find the right scale. Um, now, um, so for example, uh, if we were to jam along to just if you, if you're at home and you want to try and, and do this, uh, let's say key of C or key of A, I might get Gary to play for us. Just just do a little I don't know thing in C if you like, Gary. I, I'm just going to play in one box shape only, just C minor. Pentatonic, which is this. Okay, should we try? So just stay on C. Yeah, yeah, stay on C. C to F, say, you know. You know. One, two, two. Okay, so, so the first thing you can do if you're going to jam with a backing track is to just stay in one box shape for the track you're playing in and just get really comfortable with it. You know, just, you know, um, I think the next thing I would like to mention is the idea of creating a lick yeah. and what a lick is. Um, a lick is basically sometimes called a motif as well. It's just a short melodic passage. You, you don't, say if I was take say five notes in this scale, <clears throat> let's say, I might use the blue scale instead. So the blue scale looks like this in C. <laughs> So that's C blues. And those kind of interesting notes which are a little more chromatic are this. And here. So so um um what, a tension creator, isn't it? It is a tension creator. So what I might do is I might take five notes only in the sequence. I might say go here. Just these five notes. So um in order to create an effective lick, sometimes you just got to keep it simple, as the old saying. Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid. It's very true. Um, uh, if you want to play, say, C to F again, Gary, I'm just going to create some simple licks, really basic. Great. Now what I'm doing is I'm just trying to limit myself by playing less notes um, and trying to make something out of them. Um, and I think if you're developing your, your skills uh, uh, at a fundamental level, simple level to play backing tracks, train yourself to play less. So Phrasing. Phrasing, yeah. Let's try it again, Gary. I'm just going to keep playing less. Less, you're not committing yourself to overplaying. You're not going to play, to, you know, bad notes. You're not going to just get lost and hang yourself in the first, you know, 30 seconds of soloing. Because it's easy to just hang yourself by overplaying and just not knowing where to go next. So um, what a lick is is just take, say, take three or four notes or five notes and um, you know, create a tune. You know. <laughs> And another really simple trick you can try at home is is to use repetition. So if you get a, a part like I just did here, um, just try again, Gary. I call it the rule of threes. Do the same thing three times, then stop and get out. Let's try it again. I'll do like this idea of a simple lick with threes, then move to another one. All right, let's try again, Gary. Two, three. Change here. Yeah. So what I was doing there was just using lots of repetition. Yeah. And if creating an idea that the ear can can latch on to. Yes. And then moving on. Exactly. So I, I suppose the thing is that uh, we all know you can play more. We know you, we know you can play all over the fretboard. But if you if you're trying to just get your basic playing up over a backing track, keep it really simple, 
and get used to creating something that sounds good. Um, another thing too is also you, you know your playing skills need to develop in terms of your attack and your left and right hand. Um, as I'm playing, I'm pressing quite hard on my left hand fingers, and on the right hand I'm, I'm, I'm digging in if it's lead guitar. And you've got to you know, and also when you when you're trying to play a lick. It's not just about playing the straight note like that. You want to maybe try bend it a little sharper. You know, Steve Lukather calls it grease. You know, um, I'll play straight a straight lick. I'll put some grease in. You know, so you kind of want to take simple notes, but do something with the intonation by. The Bending and slurring the notes. You can get some expression out of it. Yeah. So, so once you know your scales, that that's one level. But then you've got to make them talk, and 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 that's with, again, left hand pressure, right hand attack, and also in your pick. What you can do is when you're soloing, is just angle your pick more, a little more like 45 degrees to your string, rather than straight on, and you get more of a rasp out of out of your note, a bit more, a bit more cut and incision, and that's really a good thing for lead guitar. Um, so what we're saying today, just is you put your backing track on, and probably definitely in the first 10 minutes, I always suggest to, to people to keep it simple and just dig in, try get a sound that sounds like you know it's got something going for it, you know, with distortion, or whatever you want to use, you know, for your, for your tone. Today I'm using some you know heavy overdrive and some some delay, which is always nice to jam with, and uh, sit there and start trying to create licks, short passages. Yep. That's pretty much covered everything that's uh, on our little list there. And um, using the whole fretboard too, do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that and also we might go to the playing effects as well. Um, with, with the whole fretboard, um, okay, this is where your, your knowledge of, of modes come in. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are seven main modes. There's the major, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, uh, Mixed Lydian, Minor and Locarian. So it's something that uh, I think afterwards we'll have available online that we'll be able to see, I believe. So that's building a scale off of every tone of the major scale. Correct, yeah. All of mode really means, if we were to get real technical, I won't keep it t too busy today, but here's C major. What the Dorian is, is just basically the same scale from the same percent degree. But what guitar players do is we refinger it. So we might rather than do it that way, go... Becomes a new shape. Um, the third mode's a Phrygian, for example. The guitar players internationally use this pattern here, which is what you'll see later on, on, on the site. So, so the idea is that once you understand the seven scales, you can utilize them for on the fretboard in different shapes. So if I'm back to the C major thing I'm doing here, if I'm using C minor. The scale that's basically right next to it is the Mixolydian scale. So it says. <laughs> then we have the Phrygian scale here. We'd have the uh, major scale. We have the Dorian scale. But you know, with blues, a lot of guitar players think in what's called pentatonic scales. So you've got C minor pentatonic works in this key, then E, E flat major pentatonic. The next scale would be F Dorian pentatonic. The next one in this key would be G Phrygian pentatonic. And the last scale of the five would be B flat major pentatonic, or B flat, sorry, mixed lead in pentatonic. So if we bring them down an octave, say, this is B flat pentatonic again, uh, sort of mixed lead in. So um, what I could do, for example, if you want to play it in C, I'll use each mode and I'll discuss, I'll mention it as it comes up. So here we go, Gary, so this is C minor. There you go. Like Gary, yeah. Then I might go to say F Dorian. Say C. 
particularly expect to say G Phrygian. <laughs> I might go to uh, E flat now. You go if you can go to F. Uh, so you back to F. Go again. That's E flat major pentatonic. And the Dorian thing I can do here. So what I might do is you want to just vamp a bit first, Gary. I'll just play a bit of everything, and you can just. So what just happened there was I was playing a little bit in F, G Mixolydian, uh, sorry, G Frisian. So B flat Mixolydian, C minor, so E flat major, play to F Dorian, G Frisian. <laughs> well, you know, you've got the whole fretboard covered, and and this is what all the world's great players do. They they'll find the key centre of one, you know, of what they're working on, and they'll work out the seven modes, and then slowly develop how to play in those modes. It's yeah. it's a long term process. That's a that's like your end result. You want to spend time getting to. It's not going to happen overnight for sure. Yeah. So most of those uh, ideas will be available on the blog at the end of the show. I assume. Um, ben, have we got time for some questions? Uh, we do. Um, we have an email first from Jerry. Uh, can you recommend any good websites to find backing tracks? Oh, jeez. No, of any myself. I think it would just be an idea of, of punching in and I, th I think a whole bunch will come up and then you, you just decide which ones are, are more suited to where you're at. Yeah, I, I, from time to time, the various guitar magazines have little bonus CDs with with backing tracks on it, and and you know generally if you go to the newsstand, you usually find them somewhere, you know. So so you know you get to buy the magazine, of course, but um, but they're usually pretty useful because they're done by you know good good programmers overseas that know what they're doing or in Australia. Um, for me personally, I, I mean I, I try to build my own backing tracks to a degree because it's hard to find ones which are either good or available. Or, in the yeah. key you want, the feeling. I guess you could also jam along with your favourite CDs, that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, like what Gary's doing is playing like a really basic two or three chord vamp, and if you can record yourself doing that and just play along with it, I mean, that's yeah. the simplest artefact. But yeah, check out the newsstands for, I think, um, some of the British magazines like Guitar have got some, some good accompanying CDs you can get some stuff from, which would be useful. Cool. Uh, we have another email from Samantha. Uh, she says, Love your show. You talk quite a bit about the importance of scales and modes. What's the best way uh, to go about learning modes and modal mixing? Yeah, okay. Well, um, the trick is basically learn one scale at a time. Um, so many guitar players all know this classic C minor scale. Imagine if you spent some amount of time learning other scales as you have on that. So I would sort of say to Samantha, look, just... Um, uh, you know, go online, find some uh, some some scale shapes. Let's let's say, for example, um, the Dorian scale. Okay, so the Dorian scale looks like this, similar to a minor. So what you want to do is you want to be able to first of all maybe get get your metronome out and and try to play it over two octaves slowly. So you do something like this, perhaps at home. Just 
that all the way up and just slightly with the metronome so you can hear that and then try it backwards and forwards so you know The idea I would suggest is to do it repetitively, repetitively, so you can keep doing it over and over in time to a metronome, say, I don't know, 80 beats a minute, and then try it at 85 beats a minute, and then keep upping the speed till you master it. With the right hand as well, what's really important is to use what's called alternate picking. So in this pattern, as you're playing a, a scale you're learning, try to do it using down and up stroke. So down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Don't do all down strokes because otherwise it's kind of like running on one leg, you know, you won't get very far. So the, the trick for, for speed on your scales is to marry your left hand in time with your right hand doing alternate picking. And, and get the ball rolling. But the next big suggestion I would definitely say to anyone watching this to develop your scale playing is to, um, you know, start playing a scale, for example, the Dorian scale. Say, try an F sharp, because it's, it's hard down here. Your fingers are stretching more, it's harder to get. And then once you finish it, do a scout, uh, fret up. And keep going. So basically, you force yourself to play each mode right across each fret position. And what will happen is that um, you will develop your, your, your finger stretching and your coordination, and also. I think your ability to visualize a fretboard from above with your eyes, because you've got to start seeing these patterns almost like a, like a, like a scale shapes. Uh, and by working on it chromatically, chromatically just means you do it in one position, then go up a fret, and keep going. So if you can basically try, try allocate, say, 15 minutes a day to, you know, or maybe one week to one new scale, to say this week I'm going to learn the Doran mode for a week. Yeah. Banish yourself. Don't play the minor scale for a week. Yeah, and what can you play the Dorian mode against too? It's not just one chord, is it? It's well, that's the other thing. Anyway. Um, the, the whole the whole issue of modes is such a deep study that I think that um, if we're to keep it simple, it's uh, and Gary's point's quite correct. What do you play it with is an issue. Um, that's probably another the whole other session on this yeah, site. Exactly. However, to get the ball rolling, you've got to learn that fingering. So if you can learn that fingering and get your coordination going so you can play it, someone says, oh, I'll play me a Doran scale, and you can do it at will, you've gotten, you've done well. And then you might move to maybe a Phrygian scale, you know, the uh, you know, that classic sort of Eastern. So you might do it again, slowly, really slowly. Across two octaves. Backwards, of course. So the idea being that you just maybe every week try a different scale, and and uh, work on those seven until it starts getting easier and easier. It's a long-term process, though. Uh, another email from Nick. Um, you had such um, a varied career. How much was planned versus taking opportunities as they were presented? Um, you have to make, I think you have to sometimes create opportunities. Um, in my situation, the phone didn't ring very often saying, I'm going to make you a star kid. So I figured, well, that's not going to happen. So what am I going to do now? So I decided to form my own project. Um, so so from my point of view, my, my experience has been creating things and, and then trying to sell them. Um, I've always tried to sell my projects and some of them sold and some of them just died. It just didn't work. And you get that. So you've got to maybe create Create some, uh, create something you believe in, and also look at the market and see what the market's buying. You know, uh, is there or is there a niche in the market that no one's covering, or if you've got a lot of talent in one area, can you be a specialist in that area? Um, I mean, the world's full of great guitar players, and how do we get noticed? I suppose it's the context you put yourself in. And I think everyone needs a vehicle for their talents. Uh, it doesn't matter what instrument you play. So if you're a horn player, well, you know, if you want to get recognised as a horn player, you better get into a band's got some profile, and that profile start getting you noticed, and then Hopefully, one thing leads to another. That's what I've generally found in my career is one thing always leads to another. Um, I remember 27 years ago, I got called to do some work for the Grand Prix uh, in Adelaide. Um, and, uh, uh, um, and as a result of working with some artists in that bill, I, I then I, I thought, oh, if I do a good job tonight, maybe I'll do another gig with them somewhere up in the future. 
and every artist um, I then spent the next 27 years working with. So one thing leads to another. It's not always a guarantee, but you've got to at least put yourself out there. Um, I think people who are most successful in the entertainment industry aren't necessarily the best players, but they're most uh, driven to promote themselves and maybe create a project which the market is interested in buying. It's not about pleasing the musicians, it's about pleasing the masses, I think. Um, depends what market you want to go for, in all honesty. You know? yeah. It depends. Yeah. Well done. Well, thanks, Rob, for coming on today, mate. That was great. Thanks for having me, Gary. It was a real pleasure. To yeah, you. I'm sure a lot of people out there would have enjoyed what you've done and what you talked about. Um, thanks for watching, everyone. Next week, we're going to have uh, John Delaney uh, on the show. He's going to be talking about hybrid picking, which is his specialty. And don't forget, you can continue today's discussion on the blog. And uh, stay tuned uh, next week, same time, same place, on the music space. We look forward to seeing you then. All right. Thanks. <laughs>